welcome to another episode of the Area 210 podcast. Today we're going to be joined by the one and only Paul Garcia here. Paul, you have a new podcast I want you to go ahead and let us know about. Yes, thank you, Joe. It's good to see you, man. It's been a while since we've talked. Um, yeah. So my new my new podcast is called the Spot Up Pod. So again, if you want to check that um, on your podcast feed, it's called the Spot Up Pod. Uh, and then I have a Substack newsletter where I do all my written work called the Spot Up Shot newsletter. So again, the spotupshot.com. It has all the information there. Uh, and then for those of you that follow my work over at, when I used to work uh, over at Project Spurs, very similar uh, type of style here, just a little bit different as well, because now I have like total control of like what I want to put on the site, on, on my newsletter and on the podcast. Yeah, so we have some news to get into, but first, you know, I want to go ahead and get your thoughts, uh, your experience that you've had there over at the, you know, covering the Spurs Media Day. How was that like, you know, being able to communicate, not with the other, just the other journalists there, but being able to talk with the Spurs players, being able to talk with some of the coaches, seeing some of the chemistry, that kind of thing. How was, the, how was Spurs Media Day? Yeah, it was it was a fun uh, time. Just like you mentioned, it was good uh, for me. Like all my friends are in the media, so you know, getting to catch up with a lot of a lot of people there, uh, and then just the the fact that the Spurs, you know, provided um, six players to talk to us as well as Coach Pop, and it was you know so, some players I'm kind of used to, you know, their their their, their interview formats such as Pop, such as Wemby, uh, Devin Vassell, those kind of players. But it was good to to hear from like Chris Paul for the first time, to hear from Harrison Barnes, uh, Stefan Castle, or he didn't speak on day one, but he spoke on day two. So uh, just some of those new players, and just to kind of hear about these new players because we haven't actually seen them on the court with the old Spurs players from, from the previous team. So that was a good uh, environment to see. And it was very much a very traditional media day where, you know, you have each player coming up and doing their interviews while in the background you have, um, you know, the photo shoots going on for, for the future, um, you know, photo stuff that's going to happen for the team. Yeah, so one of the things that I know Spurs fans were excited about, and I know you got to see this firsthand, it's the admiration and it seemed like some of the younger players had for both CP3 and Harrison Barnes, kind of like a weight lifted off their shoulders in a sense that now they're excited that they're going to have some floor generals out there. And they were just so excited. You could tell that the energy was at a high level because of what not only Harrison Barnes, but what CP3 brings as far as the knowledge they're willing to impart into this young Spurs, uh, Spurs core. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, what did they say about them? Yeah, no, they're they're just talking about how it's obvious. I mean, this feels like a different training camp to the players because they have those veterans out there. I mean, Pop's not telling Chris and, and Harrison to say these kind of things. Like they just do that because they've been in the league for you know over over ten plus years. And that was something that that they, that all the players mentioned. I mean, they're just more comfortable out there because they have these veterans. Uh, and these are and these veterans are teaching them at the same time. They're not just saying, "Hey, you did that wrong. You did that wrong." You know, they're actually showing them, "Hey, do this here. Do this. You know, work on this here." So they're they're, they're imparting their knowledge. A lot of the young players that really want to take their game to another level, such as Devin sell such as someone like Stefan Castle they're watching a playmaking guard like Chris Paul like really just watching what he does at, at all times out on the floor uh, and then something Harrison Barnes mentioned is that like just coming into a young team knowing that that this is a very young team he wants he, he mentioned the word establishing habits so again the, they have this these key words these buzzwords Chris and, and Harrison that they're using and even though we, we couldn't hear the Spurs um sent out some some practice footage on Tuesday uh, it's just kind of some b-roll footage but you can see you know, there's a bunch of young Spurs, like five or six players all around Harrison Barnes. He's kind of directing them. And you see a lot of clips of like Chris Paul telling Wemby something or telling somebody else something, you know, kind of just like they're on the side. And so, again, the Spurs kind of muted that audio out. But you can just it just shows the leadership of those two veterans already out there uh, on the floor with these young players. Yeah, I got to say, Paul, you know, this t Spurs team has a different feel about them. They don't seem... Um as young and experienced as they were before. Now that they have these savvy veterans on the court, it seems like there's a, a different confidence level now when you're look, talking with these younger players and you're they're talking to the media and you're seeing them out there in training and whatnot. There's a different vibe, and that's something that's been sorely missed since the absence of some of the other Spurs veterans that have left and are no, no longer here. It seemed like this young core kind of was in a little bit of a and a little bit of flux. And one of the key things that I took away from just listening to Chris Paul in particular talk was he said something that was very interesting to me. He's like, I want this Spurs team to kind of like slow down a little bit, you know, and, and mm -hmm. close yeah. games, you know, and kind of just, you know, don't get so overexcited. Don't get so rattled, you know, with the game on the line and them, I guess, trying to do too much. And they're just kind of getting out of sorts, you know, and, and they, make silly mistakes, turning the ball over, squandering leads in crunch time, especially with a you know, minute to go. The Spurs were right there in some of these games and they just made too many mistakes and the game got away from them. Now with CP3 here, he kind of wants to clean that up a little bit. And I'm excited about that because the Spurs 
if they had won a couple more of these games, I mean, we wouldn't have had Stefan Castle. It was all meant to be at the end of the day. But it shows that there is going to be some growth that Spurs fans, I think, are going to be very excited about this upcoming season. Well, what was your takeaway when he said that? Yeah, I know that kind of that just reminded me of all those times last year. You know, I'd write I'd write those tweets. Um, the Spurs are leading by blah 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 by, <laughs> they're losing. by fifteen points. <laughs> they're, they're they're they've led by fifteen points in so many games, but then they end up you know they have like a losing record at some of yeah. the part. And this is actually something Zach Collins actually talked about on Wednesday, where he basically said, you know, there were games when the Spurs would get up get big leads, and then the other team would come back, and they just know, they didn't know how to get stops, and then you know they end up losing the game or where if another team went on a big old run, you know, the, the Spurs just had a tough time stopping them and the, the game was just over. And and kind of what you said there, where Chris already knows that this one of their issues, this team is is crunch time. You know, the, the last five minutes of a game, they kind of tense up. They have turnovers, you know, rookie errors. Even Wemby today made that comment of, you know, making rookie mistakes uh, at different times in games. And so that's something that Chris is get, definitely going to help them, just kind of ease them, kind of calm them down, get them, you know, patient up the floor. Even someone like Harrison Barnes is going to do that as well. That was something that, who was it? Jeremy Sohan just said, Barnes has a very... um. Uh, uh, unique calmness about him when he's out on the floor. Oh, now that you mentioned Jeremy Sohan, everybody saw his his golden locks that he has. He's letting his hair grow out a little bit. What'd you think of the new do? Yeah, he's got uh, he's got he's well, he can go to two different dudes. So he's got the uh, he went on media day. He went with the cornrows, and then um, a few days later, uh, he had he had like the the afro sticking out. So it was it was a pink one. So he colored it yeah. pink. He says, and that just shows you that he's just more comfortable coming to this training camp. Whereas last year, you know, he was having to be the point guard, a role he wasn't really comfortable with, and it was it was just a tough time for him. And now he says, you know, he's more loose, he's more free, just has he just feels like just more comfortable now that uh, you know he doesn't have that expectation of have, having to be the point guard. He can just fo- focus on his natural role of power forward, and you see that just the fact he's back to changing his hairstyles and things like that yeah so that's the thing that i i kind of noticed as well jeremy sohan a, a lot of spurs fans love jeremy sohan they're like oh we, they love him because you know, they, he reminds me of, De- of dennis rodman back in the day because of the hair but they have two different styles of, of, of basketball right that they play mm-hmm. and i love jeremy sohan as a player i think he does a lot of great things out there that go unnoticed on the court and a lot of the casuals will go on and say they don't like jeremy sohan because like my friend michael jimenez looks at the effective field goal shooting but that doesn't dictate what happens in the context of the game itself. And I think that Jeremy Sohan does a lot of the little things, like I said, that go unnoticed. He moves great without the ball. I like all his backdoor cuts that he was able to get, you know, those easy buckets last season. Moves well out there on the open court, you know. And the only thing is, you know, he's just not very uh, a very good shooter. But that's fine. That can go ahead and improve over time. Um, and, you know, I commend him for trying to go ahead and fix his shot from the free throw line. Everybody made fun of him and they thought it was silly. But you know what? It actually helped his shot. So yeah. if he can go ahead and come into training camp with the better shot from the free throw line, that makes me like Jeremy Sohan even more. What don't you like about Jeremy Sohan when he's willing to do all these little things to improve his game? And then you have the faction of Spurs fans that like to point out the little nuances there. Come on, that's silly, man. You know, go ahead and, and, and embrace, embrace Jeremy Sohan. One of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, with you is the Spurs, they have a dilemma at the point guard position. It seems like they don't have enough minutes to go around right now. Oh, yeah, that's you know, mm-hmm. and that's a good problem to have because yeah, last see. season wow. we were we were they were they were relying solely on Trey Jones as a starting point guard. Now yeah. that you have CP3 for all intents and purposes, it hasn't been said, but we already know Pop is he loves his veteran, so he's probably gonna play. in in the starting lineup there. And Trey Jones is going to be coming off the bench. Then we have Stefan Castle. How do you think this is going to play out? Because we can at some point have Trey Jones, right? And we can have Stefan Castle or we could have CP3 and Trey Jones on the court at the same time. Spurs fans always think that they can only play one or the other, but that's not the case, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, like you said, it's it's a good problem to have the fact that like they went from a year ago to Jeremy Sohan as their point guard to start the year. And now all of a sudden they have too, ma- too many point guards. Uh, so, again, for most of the players, this is a good thing, except for maybe some players at the end of the roster, such as um, uh, Blake Wesley, also a guy trying to make the team is Malachi Flynn, uh, who's on a training camp contract. But, yeah, the way the way I see the rotations working out is, like you said, Chris Paul is going to be the starter. Uh, Trey Jones will be his backup, and then Stefan Castle is most likely going to play at the at the backup, I mean, shooting guard spot. But I think the Spurs will let him bring up the ball sometimes, you know, initiate some offense to get that experience. That way, he's always got Trey by his side. 
Plus, we, if you look at the data, you know, the last three years, Chris has never played more than like, I think like 60 games or, or 65 games. So he's going to, you know, just as a veteran player, the Spurs are going to rest him some nights. You know, there, there might be some nagging injuries that come along just at the fact that he's a 39 year old player coming in. So he's going to miss some games. So then, you know, players will get elevated roles, such as Trey will probably start on those nights. Uh, Stefan will become now the backup point guard. And then Blake Wesley can finally get some minutes uh, on those nights when, you know, when, uh, when one of the one of the other two point guards are out. So I think they're going to find a way to get Stefan his, his, his possessions as a point guard but he will be next to either Chris or um, Trey in different kind of lineups. Yeah, so that's interesting to me is that we're talking hypotheticals here because nothing's been set in stone. We haven't even played, the Spurs haven't even played, should I say, one game in training camp yet. Uh, that is going to be coming. They got their first preseason game that's going to be happening Monday, October the 7th at 7 p.m. Most of these games are going to be televised finally on like the CW locally here in San Antonio. Sure. Thank you. I know. I know. It's <laughs> I like. Hate, I hate having to find like random links or like, I think one year, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a oh, game was or something. App. Was, Remember the phone? Yeah. Oh. Oh, it was I, awful. I don't know what it was, but they they had some of it was one of their preseason or like a one of the open scrimmages. And um, I don't have Facebook anymore, and so I actually had to create an account just to get you know oh, watch the no. game on Facebook. So yeah, it's stuff like that. It's like man, but I'm yeah, this on TV. I hated using the phone. Remember when we had to use the phone yes, in the Spurs yeah. app to watch the games, and it's like everybody was complaining. They're like, it's hard to go ahead and put it on the screen because you didn't have the the Chromecast and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But you could still get it on on the screen if you knew, you know, but it was just making things a little bit more difficult. I'm happy now that the games are going to be locally televised on the CW. And I think they're going to be also shown on Ken's five as well. So Spurs fans are going to be happy. They're going to be able to get their first look at this young Spurs core. Hopefully we get to go ahead and see a look at CP three Harrison Barnes. The interesting uh, dynamic that I have here with not only CP three, but with Harrison Barnes is Harrison Barnes going to be able to space the floor a little bit more for the San Antonio Spurs because he's such a prolific mid-range jump sh jump shooter, you know? So he has a mid-range shot that he can knock down consistently, and I think that's going to make him dangerous and open the floor up a little bit more for the other players on the team, specifically Wembeyama. I want to see what he's able to do, and I'm looking forward to the Lob City, you know, between him and CP3. Uh, I think that's going to be pretty fun for a Spurs fan. But one of the things I wanted to point out, now that we have, you know, Harrison Barnes and CP3 on this team, I think Spurs fans... I uh, haven't really thought about how is that going to change the style of play? Are they going to still want to get out and run? Or now that they have some of these the veterans here, are they going to be more methodical in their approach? How do you think the style of play is going to play out this season? I think they're gonna they're gonna have a mixture of both a little bit more. You know, they'll still get on the run at times, and then plus they'll still have some half court offense, especially like you said in the fourth quarters when games get really close, get really tense. That's when you're really gonna want to rely on on Chris Paul's um you know half court offense to run pick and roll. But regarding Chris, you know he's gonna run a lot more pick and roll. Um, Trey Jones mentioned how this is still a very much pick and roll heavy league. Uh, and then regarding Harrison, I think he's gonna be okay in either whether they want to run or play in the half court because he's coming from a team that likes to get out and run in Sacramento. You know, led by De'Aaron Fox out there, they were a very fast paced team. Uh. Um, with Malik Monk out there as well. So I think Harrison can adapt pretty well. Chris will, you know, if there's opportunities there, he'll push the ball. But like I said, a lot more times when he's on the floor, you're probably going to get more half-court offense, especially they're going to need that in those fourth quarters when games get close. Yeah, so another thing that I was going to ask you about here, because I'm asking questions, man, because you were there and you yeah, got yeah. to see all these players, is how did Wemby look? Because I know that he's added a few pounds of muscle here. So everybody's showing the pictures, you know, out here on social media of the jacked up Wemby, you know, bulking Wemby. And, you know, and everybody's like, well, he's gained some pounds. And how is that going to affect his longevity as a player? Because we know notoriously when you have big men like that, knees, you know, the legs as far as not the legs, but as far as their feet uh, become a problem later on in their career. But Wemby does a great job of keeping himself healthy, keeping his body, you know, in, in perfect peak condition and he does a lot of stretching you know which is yes. something that i've never seen a big man of that size do before so how did he look to you now that you know he's bulked up a little bit uh i mainly saw i mean i saw i got a picture of him when he was doing the photo shoot next to Devin at one point um so i, I really didn't see like his, his lower body like his leg area i mainly just saw like his upper body but just look like more tone more you know more more frame more, there's more there's more there on his frame uh upper body wise and that's kind of something that you kind of heard the players talk about already in open practices is that he, he he's bulked up a little bit where like it's harder to, to move him off of his spots um zach collins specifically mentioned how now he's not really taking those fadeaway jumpers that he's able to get his you know his his correct release and his posture the right way when he takes those jump shots and then victor also mentioned how you know he's really working on trying to finish near the rim because obviously that's going to be the easiest place for him to score because he's so tall so that's something that he's been working on as well 
Yeah. So one of the things with, with Wemby, though, is I think he needs to still work on his three point shooting because, I mean, it's not bad, but it could be, you know, much to be desired a little bit, you know, as far as an improvement there. But one of the things that I saw, I don't know if you noticed the same thing last year, is when he's trying to go ahead and, you know, do a pull up jump or a pull up three. Right. Mm-hmm. It seems like he's so long that that's like a detriment to him. I think he needs to move back from the three point line a little bit and take that shot because he is so long. Uh, even though he's further away, I think he's going to have a more and let's say chance of making that three. His accuracy will be higher as far as his three point shooting percentage. Do you think because he's bulked up a little bit more and he has a little bit more knowledge in year two, you think his three point shooting will be uh, much to be uh, improved this year? I, I think it, it should see a little bit of an increase just because of the fact that I think he's going to get set up a little bit better when he's when he's open on his pick and pops on his spot up threes. Uh, I think those will be those will be possessions. Um, just the fact you know Chris Paul's out there now, Harrison can throw up some passes, Stefan Castle, those kind of players. So he should be getting better delivery on where the pass is coming into him. I don't know if he has to go to so many pull up threes like he did a year ago. He actually shot uh, better as a pull up three shooter, if I recall the data compared to spot up um, numbers. But um, yeah, I don't think he has to do that as often because he has now more playmakers around him in this coming season and one thing i want i want to give him credit to is that for a young player only 20 years old he's very analytically savvy he knows like he, he's seen the data he's he, he will say you know i know that rim shots three-point shots are the most important shots in basketball right now i i you know i know that you know we got to try to limit mid-rangers as much as possible because they're, they're analytically the worst shots you can take in a game and so that's something that he actually comments on is the fact that he knows he's he's either supposed to try to score at the rim or um, from the three-point line yeah so moving forward here and getting away from Wemby a little bit, because I want to focus more on some of the younger players. The, we had a lot of younger players that really played some minutes last season. And this season, because we have a, a good problem to have, you have veterans, your lineup's going to change, your starting five, your second unit's going to change, and that's going to leave not enough minutes to go around. So now that we kind of got a glimpse of some of these younger players, what do you think is going to happen with them as far as how the minutes are going to be distributed between them? They're going to have to learn that, yeah, like you're right, like they're not going to get as many minutes as they had. Some of the players who played a lot more, maybe somebody like Sohan, like Keldon Johnson, those kind of veteran players who, have, who are still young but have been on the team for a number of years. And also, you know, players who who were who got real minutes last year, such as Blake Wesley, such as Malachi Branham, um, Julian Champagny, right? Those guys, they're not guaranteed those minutes now. They actually got to compete for them uh, this coming training camp and preseason. And and for some of these wings, I mean, there are going to be some minutes at least because Devin Vassell's injury. But once the team's fully healthy, um, you know, a few weeks into the season when Vassell makes his return i mean those minutes are going to be gone completely and so you're right i mean it's really about you know it's it's really just a battle here in terms of um you know fighting for for um, not only a roster spot but also for um you know a place in the rotation because you know they're not going to bump out some of those other players like chris paul like wemby those guys jeremy Stone, those guys already have the role set uh it's going to be about you know where those extra minutes at and, and yeah that i mean that, that's a good thing to have i guess like you said like to have that competitiveness um here coming into training camp yeah, because even though these uh, players are young and they're kind of fan favorites in a way, you know, Spurs fans are enamored with them. Uh, they're more of an insurance policy. So if your vets get injured, you're going to have somebody that can come in and, you know, be a body that take up those minutes and fill the roster spot. Same thing in the second unit. Or if you're going to go ahead and give somebody a night off because you got to rest them over the 82 game season, that's going to be where I believe these young players are going to be able to get some minutes and maybe shine a little bit, you know, given the the limited minutes that they do get. So Spurs fans will get excited about about that from time to time. But uh, another thing that I've been noticing here is I'm excited just overall with the Spurs team itself. You know, we're entering a new era here. Wemby year two, there's been a lot of talk here with Spurs fans about how much this team is going to be able to turn things around uh, with Wemby going into year two. And now with the addition of CP3 and Harrison Barnes. Now I've already gone on record and I've, I've given my prediction about how many wins the Spurs team is going to be expected to get this season. I'm thinking it's going to be somewhere realistically between the numbers of 37 and 35. If they go and exceed that, to me, that's exceeding expectations. Even if the team got 43 wins, I think that'd be enough to kind of flirt with the play-in. Yeah. But in the West, it's not going to be enough to get you into the play-in. Uh, what are your expectations as far as a prediction, should I say, for the upcoming season as far as their win total? I'm I'm kind of right there with you. I haven't finished my so I finished my Eastern Conference prediction, and I was uh, two games over 500 for the Spurs, and that's the easy conference. I mean, they only got yeah. two games against some of those bad teams. So um, I, I'm with you. Where I'm kind of right now. I'm in that 35 to like 38 win win range, cause somewhere around there. Uh, like I mean, the the thing is, man, they play in the West. That's as yeah. good as I mean, they have gotten better. I, I'll admit that they've gotten better. 
they should be there. It's just that, man, they don't have any easy teams this year. Like they're only going to, the only teams out West that are easy are Portland and Utah. That's it. Like, you know, the Clippers, maybe if Kawhi doesn't come back in time, but that's about <laughs> it. Three teams that you're better than. Cause I mean, Houston's still really good. Golden State, the Lakers, Memphis is back to being a juggernaut now that, now that, um, uh, Jaws completely healthy and, uh, and they added Zach E. So like, the West is just – it's just the fact that they're in that conference. And so, I, again, they're going to win more than 22 games from last year. They're, I think they're going to be in every game, and it's going to, again, come down to those final few minutes. Um, you know, you know how, how, how do they respond there? But but I see kind of like right in that playing bubble, and maybe they're I, – I, again, I wouldn't say right now that they're going to make it through the playing tournament, but kind of right below those teams that maybe finish right outside of it. So, again, it's really early. I'd say about 35, 38 wins. Been, and that's still improvement compared to where they were a year ago. The fact that they're actually fighting for a playoffs play-in spot uh, could be something else. unless, like I said, some other West teams have some injury issues or chemistry issues. Then there's a chance that the Spurs might be able to leap up even further. But again, I, I, that, that you're, you're really waiting on hypotheticals in those cases. Yeah. So it, the way that the West is stacking up right now, you're probably going to have your usual, usual suspects. You know, I, I still predict that OKC will be in there in the, there in the mm-hmm. mix. You know, I the same thing with uh, Minnesota. You know, Golden State will probably be there with the Lakers vying for that that final roster spot as far as the playoffs go. Uh, Denver's going to be in there. You got the Dallas Mavericks. And the the big question marks to me is like, how good is this Suns team going to be? You know, oh, I think what are they going to do? <laughs> you know, well, I think they're still good. I mean, not maybe not top four, but definitely like yeah. six, you know, five through like eight range. That's guaranteed for them. I mean, just they, the, they, they got some some um, better de- veteran pieces. Plus, they got uh, Tyus Jones, the point guard there. Uh, while having most they have stuff. talent, they have mm-hmm. talent, but it just seems like sometimes they just can't put things together. You know, they were yeah. uh, almost like not even that long ago they were over here in the with the finals. You know, and yes, and and now it's like they couldn't get back there again. It's hard to get there, you know. But with all the talent they have, it's just kind of they haven't met to me the expectation. Then you have you know the Utah Jazz. Of course, we know they're not going to be very good. Memphis Grizzlies, man. This team is a big question mark for me in the West. What do you think they're going to do? I think they're going to be good again. I think they're going to be um, kind of in that top six range uh, anywhere in there just because if they can just stay healthy and as long as Jock can stay on the court, I mean, that's that's a very good ball club, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies. So I, I really expect them to be really good again this year. Plus, they added some some depth there uh, with um, Zach Eady, and everyone should be healthy. Marcus Smart, Jaron Jackson Jr., uh, and then a lot of their role players, they're, they're a team who, you know, they, they have like, you know, players at the end of the bench who end up turning into really good role players. And, and they're, again, they're returning fully healthy, um, except for I think one player got hurt. Uh, Gigi Jackson, I believe it was, recently got injured. But but aside from that, I mean, they should be really good. What about the experiment that's going to happen now in Minnesota, now that the big cat's gone over to the Knicks? You know, now you're going to have Randall and you're going to have DiVincenzo. Uh, to me, it just seems like Minnesota got smaller because they're going to go with Cat, yeah. uh, not Cat, but Anthony Towns now, right? They're going to go with Ant-Man now. So now that they're going to go with the Ant-Man, and now that they're going to be playing that small ball, my thing is, yes, they do have some size still with Rudy Gobert, but... Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to be a small team. They're going to be fast. They're going to be athletic, but they're still going to be a small team. So if they go up against a team that has a big man or athletic big man, uh, that might give them some trouble, especially when they go up against teams that have some length. Uh, how well do you think this Minnesota Timberwolves team is going to be moving forward? I think they're still going to be, um, you know, a top five team out west as well. Maybe not, maybe not, maybe not top three anymore, but or yeah, maybe they could still sniff top three. Uh, definitely not better than OKC, but I, I just think they still have a, the player who I don't really, um, you know, um, I've never been a fan of really is, is Julius Randle. I just don't like his game the way he plays more <laughs> so like that that half court, you know, very much like post up kind of offense. So, but the fact that they have Ant, they have Rudy Gobert still, they have Jaden McDaniels, um, Nas Reed was really good in the playoffs. They just have a lot of depth on this team as well, and so they 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 added Joe Ingles, a shooter. For from um, Australia over the off season. So I just think that they still have too many good pieces. And just the fact that Ant can really take over a game on night to night basis. Uh, I still think they're, they're a top three West team out there. Yeah. So that's the way the West is stacking up. It's going to be hard for the Spurs. They're going to have to go ahead and contend with some very good teams. But the thing is the trajectory for the Spurs, they are getting better. You yes. know, we saw mm-hmm. that in years past, the West was kind of surpassing the, the Spurs in terms of talent. But now the disparity between that, those two, is getting smaller and smaller with the Spurs getting better and better as far as their 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 roster. Uh, they still have a, a lot of picks to come, you know, and some yes. of them might not convey, but nonetheless, they still have a lot of picks. And that's the thing that's kind of good, but not good, because when you get picks, you have to make roster spots. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't that means that the more people that you get in this draft moving forward, 
where are you going to put them all? That means you're going to have to let go of some of these players, again, that the fans get enamored with. And that's just the nature of things. So moving forward here, I know we, we can talk about hypotheticals all we want, but right now, what does the Spurs cap space look like in case they did want to make a trade as they move further into the season? Um, I mean, they're they're not they're not in the luxury tax, so they so they're over the cap, but they have room to make trades. You're right; like they can take in players uh, into into their into their that not cap space, but that window before the luxury yeah. tax uh, line. So they're they're not even close to that. So they're they're okay to make to take in big contracts. The issue would be for them is who are they trading with, and and, and then like those teams are all probably all over like the first or second yeah. apron. And there's so there's there's limitations on who they're trading with, but probably for the Spurs' sake, they're not in any kind of danger of of like going past the luxury tax line. So they can take in a big contract. Um, they just depends on who are they sending out and can that other team fit in some players in that yeah in the, that the numbers have to match as far in terms of salary so that's mm-hmm. the, the big question mark there you know and i know that a lot of uh, the news has been keldon johnson you know and i like keldon johnson he's slimmed down you know he's looking better out there but his name always comes up it seems like when you're trying to go ahead and have the spurs thrown in with talking with other teams in terms of of trade i i hope that we can keep Keldon because I think he's a great player and he does great things for the community. But in terms of trades, I mean, his number is attractive as far as the contract goes because it's getting smaller as he gets yes. near the end of that contract. So that's why I believe his name comes up so often in, in these trade speculations, you know? Yeah. And for him, I mean, it's it's just been a, a tough go around the last few years just because he doesn't really have like a position that like you can you can just say that he plays perfectly or the position that he does play, which is like kind of like that backup kind of power forward role. Um, um, he's more like a, like a again, like a slashing driving kind of player who needs contact at the rim. His three point shot has kind of come and gone. And and on this team now with Wemby, with Vassell, with all these guys, Harrison Barnes, there just aren't those kind of possessions for him. Um, and that's why they had to put him in the, in the second unit where he could kind of be a little bit more like the six man create for himself um, a little bit more there but overall i think overall like you just don't know where long term where he fits yeah. on the team so that's like you're, you're right we're like he has the, the attractive contract there like 17 18 million plus another team maybe needs that kind of a player but right now again on this spurs roster i'm not sure that they quite need um that kind of a player right now in terms of the role that he plays and so that's why i think he's always going to be you know his name will always be floated in trade rumors until you know the, his next contract yeah but nonetheless paul we're going to be excited because spurs basketball is going to be back on the screen Starting Monday, so I know I'm excited, you're excited, but some some news that broke earlier today is something that I wanted to talk with you about. Everybody knows about Bill Land, you know, and mm-hmm. Sean Elliott and their chemistry and Bill Land's voice right there, you know, announcing games with uh, the great Sean Elliott. But the problem is, is that as of late, Bill Land has had some health concerns, he's had some problems, and that's kind of put him out of being able to announce like, you know, the whole season and be there for every single game and whatnot. Uh, We wish him the best. He was a great voice, a great chemistry that he had with Sean Elliott, but it was announced today that the Spurs did hire uh, Jacob R. Toby as the new play-by-play announcer. And I know that a lot of Spurs fans don't know a lot about him. I know that he was calling games over with the Austin Spurs in that G League with, um, uh, another, with another friend of ours. Uh, So the thing is, is how is he going to how how is he going to fit in this whole announcing thing you know that the as far as the chemistry goes you know i i've really i've heard his voice and he's not bad but a lot of spurs fans don't know a lot about him i mean we're just going to to me it's just kind of wait and see and and see what happens we're going to get his uh, i guess his first taste of what he can do in these spurs preseason games um but what are your first thoughts on like jacoby artobi yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I haven't heard any of his. I, I can't recall hearing his voice as well on um, yeah. a different broadcast based on his experience from where he's coming from. Uh, but I mean, the big, the big important thing is that you know he just has to build that chemistry with Sean Elliott. That's the big thing, and also Dan Weiss, who kind of uh, comes in with, like the stats and stuff during the broadcast and does like some of the sideline reporting at times. So again, if he could just build good chemistry with Sean and, and Dan, I think he's going to be okay. I mean, obviously he's got big shoes to fill in terms of Bill. I mean, Bill was so unique. He was he was awesome voice. Just the, the way he made his, he basically made a lot of those, um, you know those those key phrases for the spurs you know um um you know so so that's one thing like just kind of over the years just kind of stuff that he would that he would yell out and everything and and his kind of own catchphrases so again uh you know that that's that those are big shoes to fill but again if he could just build that cohesion and make it a very um, you know entertaining uh kind of basketball game to watch every night uh, whenever the, the spurs have games like on bally's or cans or wherever um you know that they're commentating he and sean so so again i'm, I'm eager to see i'm you know my, my my ears are open to hear how he how it goes and you know, we'll see if it's an enjoyable uh broadcast and <laughs> 
it's not, then I'll probably just put on like, you know, a podcast just while I'm watching. But no, it should be fine. They should be good. Yeah. I like to hear Sean Elliott's knowledge at all times, no matter what. He, he does a good job of, um, you know, bringing back stories and also, um, you know, breaking down different kind of plays and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up something here as we start bringing the show to a close here. Uh, one of the things that's always been, you know, really big here with Spurs fans is how they can go ahead and, and, and ingest how they're going to be able to watch it. I say the games moving forward. Uh, the landscape is changing. You know, the the advent of streaming services and, and them jockeying for position here. And, you know, they're they're bidding billions of dollars for the rights to even, you know, showcase these games. You have Amazon Prime that's going to go ahead and enter the fray because they're making a deal with Bally Sports. Bally Sports has kind of been in some trouble, you know, filing for bankruptcy and whatnot. Yeah. And it seems like they're still trying to, you know, stay afloat here. And now that they're trying to go ahead and ink this deal where they've inked this deal out with Amazon Prime, what that means moving forward for Spurs fans is the way they're going to be able to see these games. So now... Uh, you had to go ahead and pay $20, something like that. I, I'm probably going to be an increase now moving forward into the season. It used to be $20 a month if you wanted to go ahead and watch your your Spurs as far as your regional sports coverage here in the great state of Texas. Um, now that they've inked the deal with Amazon Prime, a lot of Amazon Prime users, you're not going to be able to watch these games, I don't think, this season. I think it's going to convey next season. And Amazon Prime users, I think they're under the impression that because they already have Prime, that they're going to be able to watch the Bally Sports, regional sports, uh, you know, in their area for free. And I don't think that's going to be the case. What I think Amazon's going to wind up doing is they're going to say, you can watch your regional sports. We're going to have these regional sports packages, but you're going to still have to pay 20 something dollars a month in lieu of what you're already paying for Amazon Prime. So if you do the math, Amazon Prime's like maybe 20 bucks on its own. So you're going to pay twenty dollars a month. That's a total of forty dollars yeah. for you to be able to watch the Spurs uh, on Amazon Prime. Now, if you just get the standalone app, it's twenty dollars on its own. The other way that you're going to be able to watch the Spurs play is if you already have like Direct TV streaming, for example, because they include Bally Sports. I yeah. believe Spectrum Cable here locally also includes the Bally Sports reg regional sports package. But a lot of the other streaming services like Hulu, Fubu. YouTube TV, for example, they drop Bally Sports because mm -hmm. they don't want to have to pay uh, that exuberant amount of money that they're asking and pass that off onto the consumer. Now we have a new uh, conglomerate that's entered the fray here. I don't know if you heard about this, but this is important. It's an important because this is going to have a, a an impact, a dramatic impact, I think, in pricing moving forward. And that is DirecTV has acquired Dish Network. And will, along with acquiring Dish Network, they also acquired Sling TV, which is owned by Dish Network. So what that means in layman's terms is Direct TV is now going to be one of the biggest streaming services or biggest streaming providers out there. And they're already kind of pricey, you know, because their ticket, their, what they're charging for their packages is quite more expensive than what you're seeing everywhere else. But they have a lot of sports that they're you know, putting in these other packages. Their, their mid-tier and their top-tier packages have a lot of sports that they pack in. Um, now that they've acquired Dish Network, expect those prices to go up even more. Mm. What does that mean along in long terms for the consumer? It means that as these, let's say, four-letter networks like ESPN, you know, you have your TNTs, for example, they got the one year left on, on their mm. contract, right? Now that you have Amazon and you're going to have NBC now acquiring these games, now that they pay more money to see these, you know, to, so they can showcase these games on their respective streaming services, that means that the consumer probably over the next year or so, they're going to wind up paying a lot more to watch not only Spurs games, but uh, sports in general. So the even though that people were saying before, hey, we're going to cut the cord because it's, essentially it was cheaper, it's starting to change. And now what's going to happen is that they gave you a little taste of what freedom was away from cable. But in the long run, even though you're not having a set top box, you're not having to pay, you know, all these other fees that they get you for. At the end of the day, the bottom line price to watch sports is going to get more expensive. I mean, just out of the data that I've given you, I mean, what are your thoughts on the landscape of the streaming services now? Well, that's kind of my, that was my situation for this upcoming season where um, I've had direct TV stream and obviously, you know, it is very pricey. The, the, see where, where, where I live, I don't live in San Antonio anymore. So I have to get, you know, pay as much as I can just to get the Spurs games. Obviously I cover them for, you know, that's one of my, my jobs here. And so, um, you know, I was actually trying to get out of that contract and try to go find, um, you know, I was actually looking at YouTube TV while well, like yeah. you just said, I found out that YouTube TV does not have a contract with Bally sports. And so I was like, Oh, well, I can't leave them for that. And then, um, so 
you know, as you were talking about, maybe Amazon in the future, uh, you know, I already have an, an Amazon subscription, but maybe like you're saying, maybe they're going to charge more just to get values on yeah. there. So, yeah, I mean, like, like you're right. I mean, obviously it's expensive and, and that's kind of where like you kind of have to make that you're going to have to make that financial decision of do you want to invest and in, I mean, continue to pay for for access to the games. And like, like I said, for me, I have to have, you know, the Spurs games. I need to watch yeah. them as part of what I do. And so, uh, you know, I'm unfortunately going to have that's part of my what I make uh, financially is going to have to go into um, that, that bill monthly for direct TV stream or or whoever has the games. I was going to ask you, do, do you have the Bally Sports uh, app? Is it available for you? I don't, but I think because I have Directv, um, uh, well, they all the, I have all the Bally Sports channels because you know they come into my Directv package. But I think also uh, if I if I use these the app, I can sign in with my Directv um, login and it'll give me access because I, I remember watching them um, out of town and somewhere yeah. else one time. So I was going to say maybe Bally Sports the standalone a la carte might be an option for you because I know just by itself it's twenty dollars. But the problem is is that the app on the phone and sometimes mm -hmm. even the smart TVs it works when it wants to. So oh, you'll okay. be watching, then all of a sudden it crashes. Then you're trying to get back in and you're missing key moments of the game or you missed a play and you're like, that's why I'm watching the game and that's why you're paying you know, so much every month so you can watch these moments and experience them in real time. And when things like that happens, it, it really upsets the fan base. And that's what's been going on with the Valley Sports app. I know a lot of people have been complaining about it. It doesn't seem to be getting any better, but they're still charging you $20 a month. You know, yeah. so... That's that's the nature of things right now. But hopefully things will get better. You'll have more choices uh, as far as being able to watch the San Antonio Spurs. But for right now, I mean, it's either NBA League TV, Direct TV stream, Valley Sports, getting that a la carte or going ahead and going with maybe uh, another service provider that might be able to offer those regional sports packages for you. But, Paul, what do you have coming up uh, for your podcast here? Uh, actually, I actually have a podcast dropping this uh, Friday morning. I just recorded it. So it's just kind of um, kind of what you and I talked about here where uh, I kind of just took a um, listen to all the audio and, and, and quotes from the players and Coach Pop and uh, for the past week. And I kind of just put them into a podcast episode of, of just kind of giving my big takeaways for the team. And I'm really eager for um, – for Monday to start when, when we actually get some real preseason um, uh, uh, games going on, because like, I'll tell you one thing, coach pop and the players did not want to tell us anything about the lineups that are going to oh, be in yeah. the future. They all, all the players kind of just push that question aside and even pop gave a very sarcastic answer when asked about, you know, what the lineups might look like. So aside from saying that Wemby's for sure going to start, you know, so <laughs> yeah. So I can't wait till Monday just to kind of see what some of the, um, you know, lineups look like. And we do know that preseason games, some players are going to you know miss games from here and there. So, so I, I'm just eager for Monday to get here now at this point. Yeah. Hey, I was going to ask you before I let you go. Are you going to be around for the silver and black scrimmage? Is going to be happening October the 19th? I won't be there for that one. No, no, I won't. I won't. I, I was just here uh, in San Antonio for me today. Actually, I might because I do have to come back. To, I have to make one more trip to San Antonio. So who knows? Maybe I, I'm not going to say, say it, guarantee it's a no yet. So we'll You're see. not going to say you guarantee it. OK, yeah. but, you know, I put my name in the hat, you know, to go ahead and see if I can get those free uh, silver and black scrimmage tickets. So they give you four total, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. yeah, I'll, I'll keep you in the loop, Paul. If you're going to be okay. in town, maybe, maybe we sneak you in. <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's episode of the area 210 podcast. Make sure you go and follow, follow Paul. He's a great follow on the X. Make sure you subscribe to his new podcast and support him and make sure you're going ahead and following us on the X as well. You can follow us at area 210 podcast. Paul, where can they follow you on the X? Uh, on, on X um, at Paul Garcia NBA. And then also at the spot up shot. There you go. Then you know how to go follow Paul. He's great when it comes to analytical data. You love his spreadsheets. And you also like to hear him talk about the cap space and what Spurs fans can expect in case trades are going to be made this upcoming season. Uh, the upcoming season, should I say. So for Paul Garcia, this is Joe Garcia. Thank you all for watching another area of the Area 210 podcast. And like we always say, spread the love, stop the hate, be kind. We're out. Peace.